Welcome to another edition of Horse Center, everyone. I am Brian Zipsy, and as always, I have the excellent pleasure of being joined by my co-host to the East Coast. That's Matt Schiffman. How are you today, Matt? I am good, Brian. I'll tell you, I've been taking it easy this week. I uh, needed a little time to recover from that uh, big week of racing at Belmont Park. Well, well done out there, Matt. Uh, way to uh, represent Horse Center. I hope you had a great time at Belmont Park uh, over the long, extended, stakes-packed weekend. Yeah, absolutely did, Brian. And hey, and, and I just want to say, I saw so many Horse Center fans um, at Belmont Park, uh, way more than usual. Thank you to all of you for watching the show. Oh, that's nice, Matt. I like to hear that. Also, the stars were out, Matt, the equine stars, that is. Let's Let's start with Big Mo, Mo Donegal. Matt, uh, I thought he was the horse to beat going in. I, I, I tried to beat him a little bit, but uh, there was no denying Mo Donegal was much the best in this Belmont Stakes. He was much the best. And and for me also, Brian, you know, if, if I was pushed to give a pick for the uh, Belmont Stakes, I, I said to people it was Mo Donegal, but uh, it was kind of one of those races where, you know, I didn't feel ultra confident and he performed, Brian, way beyond uh, on my expectations and took control of that race and uh, was ahead by three lengths well uh, into the stretch and, and, and maintained that margin. Yeah, I think that I think the key to the race and, and, and we thought it could happen is that Mo Donegal was able to stay a little bit closer than he has in a lot of his races. Of course, the Remsen winner. The Wood Memorial winner. Uh, he's never run a poor race, even in those losses in the Kentucky Derby and the Holy Bowl earlier this year at Gulfstream Park. He always runs well. He always finishes off his races. But Irad Ortiz Jr. did a good job getting involved. He was involved. He was in the middle of the pack, and he wasn't that far off the lead. If we see the people early, Matt, frankly, he looked good all the way around. He made that ex explosive move. And as you said, he had three legs quickly to the rest of the field. And from there, it was just coasting to the wire. For my money, Matt Shipman, for my money, Mo Donegal, that was the most impressive of the three triple crown races of any horse. And I don't know about you, but on my NTRA poll submission this week, I had Mo Donegal on top of the three-year-olds. I did the same thing, Brian. And I guess this is a year where uh, uh, three-year-old racing fans have to give a lot of credit to the Wood Memorial because the Top two finishers in that race, Brian, won two of the legs of the Triple Crown. So maybe it turned out to be the best prep this year. Yeah, let's say it. The, the Preakness winner, the Belmont winner. Hey, even Skippy Longstocking ran a very good Belmont. Uh, third in the Belmont. Out of a third in the Wood Memorial, I guess he had the Preakness in between. But still, the, the Wood Memorial produced uh, two-thirds of the Triple Crown winning, a uh, uh, long shot third-place finisher in the Belmont. So the much maligned uh, Wood Memorial has its year, and hopefully we'd like to see that continue, maybe back to a grade one next year. Matt, I also should mention those much maligned distance races late in the year at Aqueduct, because if you looked at the Remsen, of course, that was a bang-up race with Mo Donegal edging. Uh, Zandon, but also the Demoiselle, yep. where Nest won. So the Remsen Demoiselle exact in the Belmont, because Nest ran a very good race and was clearly second best. The Philly was clearly second best in the Belmont. Yeah, hats off to, to Nest for uh, her performance in the Belmont. Uh, she was she was coming and running at the end of the race. Um, we the people, you know, couldn't couldn't get the mile and a half. Tough tough thing to do, Brian, is to to win the Belmont on the front end. You, you, you've got to be a special horse to do that, as we, you know, as we saw with uh, uh, Justify and American Pharaoh uh, doing it. And, hey, I bet that Pletcher Exacta uh, that I gave out uh, on the, the, the last show. Well done, Matt. Yeah, I, I was hoping that We the People was not going to be the winner of the Belmont for for a few reasons, I, I thought it would be a better Belmont if we the people did not wire this easy on the lead all the way around. And so I was happy to see Skippy Longstocking at least staying close. And then Nest not far behind him. And Mo Donegal not far behind her. Todd Pletcher certainly knows how to get horses ready for the Belmont Stakes. Proven time and time again and never more than when they ran 1-2. Mo Donegal and Nest 
Rich Strike uh, last early, even though he was a lot closer. That's not his uh, running style to be closer, uh, even though he was last. And uh, as we suspected, it wasn't Mo Don uh, Rich Strike stay, nor did Creative Minister do much. They said he didn't like the deep track. I don't know. He was fifth. Uh, we the people fourth. Skippy Longstocking ran a good race in third. But Pletcher won two, clearly the best two in my eyes. Now, Mo Donegal was impressive, Matt. We, we gave Mo Donegal props here, and he's certainly got a chance to be three-year-old champion at the end of the year. Travers bound, I'm sure. But I, I don't know if he was the star of that show at Belmont Park on Saturday because, uh, you know, flight line, my heavens, Matt, what, what a horse this is. I mean, you just you just look at him physically and you say, wow, is he impressive. And then the race he ran in that Met Mile um, out of the gate, Speaker's Corner with all that speed, and then Speaker's Corner quickly shut him off early in the race. Uh, Flightline had every reason in his first race of the year, in his first race outside of Southern California to get beat, and he did nothing of the sort. Yeah, a lot of things that he had to prove, a lot of things that he hadn't done before, Flightline had to do, along with, of course, living up to the fact that he won uh, his first three races, each one by more than 10 lengths. Uh, uh, so much hype. And and I think the picture that we have on the screen, Brian, it, it uh, uh, says it all because a uh, flight line looks like, hey, you know, ears flopping around, happy as can be, and you couldn't see the second horse is all blurred in the background there. Uh, uh, wasn't quite a, a, a double-digit length victory, but six-length victory against that kind of field with the troubled start that flight line had, lunging at the start, having to st steady a little bit, uh, early in the race a couple of times but then you know flavian pratt was patient moved to the outside and when that happened brian it was all over poor speaker's corner poor speaker's <clears throat> corner mouth this is a very nice horse speaker's corner is a grade one animal i'm convinced of that uh, but he just had no answers even though the the ride the early ride especially was all in speaker's corner's favor but uh, Flightline is just too good. Flightline is uh, m one of the most impressive horses of certainly this century, and maybe you could even go farther back. I, I know it's only been four races, and you and I are both ones that like to see really good horses run at least 12, 15 times in their career, Matt, but we probably will never see that from Flightline, but I guess we need to enjoy him when he's on the track. It looks like the mile and a quarter, interestingly, the mile and a quarter Pacific Classic is probably next. Uh, again, spacing out the races a little bit, uh, that it would be about a three month gap, almost a three month gap between the Met Mile and the 10 furlong Pacific Classic at Del Mar. And that mile and a quarter at Del Mar grade one race out there would likely be a prep for the mile and a quarter Breeders' Cup Classic. Matt, do you have uh, many concerns about this horse out of an, uh, a nice Indian Charlie merit named Feather getting 10 furlongs in races like the Pacific Classic and then certainly the Breeders' Cup Classic? No, I think my concerns with uh, Flightline uh, are about him staying healthy, his feet staying good. Uh, uh, and being able to prepare on a, you know, on a normal schedule for the races that he has planned. But, you know, hey, if he gets in the Pacific Classic against the usual suspects that have been running in those kind of races in California, Brian, I think he could go around backwards and beat them. Yeah, and to tell you the truth, Matt, I don't know who beats him in the Breeders' Cup Classic either. I really don't have too many concerns about 10 furlongs for this horse. I think his speed will just be uh, very, very, very tough to deal with as he stretches out. Uh, he's got distance on the uh, on, on the male side of the pedigree. He's got more speed on the female side of the pedigree. But just looking at him, looking at the way he moves, looking at his physicality, I, I don't think 10 furlongs will be a problem. It's a big step up still. He's never been farther than one turn, so we'll see. But I think you said it best. I think it's a matter of of staying healthy and making those big races on his schedule. So we'll see flight line in, uh, oh, about 11 weeks from now in the Pacific Classic, hopefully, because he is a monster. 
there's no doubt in my mind that he is the best horse in American racing, the best horse in the world. Uh, just a matter of how many times we will see him. Now, Matt, Flightline is a big, a big beast of a horse that just dominates, dominates his competition four times running now in big races. But Jack Christopher is not that same kind of physical specimen. He, he's a little bit smaller. He's a son of money inside of a half hour mares. But uh, I tell you what, it, it, Flightline had to put on a show to be more impressive than Jack Christopher was in winning the grade one Woody Stevens. Yeah, that's for sure. Uh, Flightline four for four, Jack Christopher now four for four. Uh, uh, Jack Christopher uh, won the Woody Stevens by 10 lengths. Um, yeah, uh, uh, another super performance and, and another three-year-old, Brian, in a pretty darn good crop of three-year-olds this year. Yeah, I, I was thoroughly impressed. I know this is seven furlongs, and I know just like Flightline, uh, he's never been two turns, but the winner of the grade one champagne and the grade two pate mile, I think this was his best race yet. Um, he had to uh, 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 show some ability to, to rate just a little bit because it looked like early in the race he wanted to go to the lead, and Provocateur was obviously wanting the lead. So Jack Christopher was able to to take off provocateur just a little bit, sit there and wait and relax. And when he pounced, wow, that was impressive. Much, much like Flatline, Jack Christopher just completely dominated a good field. Uh, no speaker's corner or happy saver in the Woody Stevens, but there were some fast three-year-olds in there and he he basically made them look silly, Matt. Uh, it'll be interesting now because we said Flatline is going to jump up a quarter mile for the Pacific Classic at the beginning of September. Jack Christopher is scheduled to stretch out from seven furlongs. He's been a mile twice, but this was a seven furlong race, and he'll be asked to stretch out to nine furlongs, two turns in Monmouth Park's Haskell in July. Yeah, I will look forward to that, certainly. And like you said, he did go the one-turn mile as a two-year-old, and, and he seems to be uh, over his problems that he uh, – needed a little surgery uh, to have a bone chip taken out over the winter. And yeah, that was uh, a very impressive uh, uh, three-year-old performance for Jack Christopher. Yeah, absolutely. And this, this is a horse that uh, Chad Brown compares to goat doctor. So uh, in good company uh, as far as what his trainer thinks of him. And uh, yeah, super impressive. I don't, I don't think nine furlongs at Monmouth will be a problem. I, I'm not sure about 10 furlongs in races like the Travers possibly, or the Breeders' Cup Classic down the road, but uh, nine furlongs at Monmouth should be right up his alley. And I tell you what, uh, as good as Mo Donegal was, and we said we both have him number one on our current three-year-old polls, I think the favorite to be the three-year-old champion at the end of the year became Jack Christopher with this type of performance he turned in in the Woody Stevens. Yeah, he's certainly one that has to be considered. And then, then there are other uh, promising three-year-olds uh, like Zandon and that we have to see how they come back uh, when they race next. I think we saw a lot of future champions or, or, or champions that will uh, repeat uh, on this Belmont Stakes weekend. Uh, the one thing that we did see in the Ogden Phipps was a clash of champions from last year, Malathot and Latruska. And wouldn't you know it, the, uh, the third choice stepped up Matt, last year last year clarier yeah tried malathot four times malathot beat her four times the first time they meet here as you can see clarier got the best of malathot down the stretch in the grade one ogden fits uh yeah she did and and uh, let's let's face it uh last year clarier was a horse that was getting better and better um, as the year went on, which is a characteristic of some of the best horses that Steve Asmussen trains. And, and she got a big, big win against the best company uh, in the Ogden Phipps. Yeah, interestingly, we need, we, we need to talk about Latruska. She was a pretty heavy favorite, despite how good this field was. But uh, it looks like Latruska really doesn't want to be – want to have the race taken to her early. Uh, I've seen her stalk and run well, but when she's on the lead and somebody pressures her, like search results, the talented Chad Brown Philly did here in the Ogden Phipps, Latruska did not like it. Maybe she's lost a step from five to six. She looked good in her first two races, but 
but now two of the last four races, she has pretty much packed it in with the strong pace pressure. Yeah, you know, uh, I heard uh, trainer Faustino uh, talking a number of times before the race and, and should have listened closely because uh, he was making some comments that made it sound like uh, Latruska may not have been on it been at her best he said how in the past when she uh runs big she's like she's a horse that kind of starts kicking down the stall and gets very high spirited but uh at belmont park uh before the octon fib she was pretty mellow and you know he didn't know if that was because she'd been to belmont before and won that race familiar surroundings etc um i don't know uh, the the way she gave it up fairly early after a half a mile makes me think it was more than just she doesn't like to be headed. She didn't seem to be at her best to me. Yeah, I, I, I'll buy that, Matt. And, and it'll be interesting to see how Latruska comes back. I, I, I did not think uh, one brother would push the other Ortiz brother. They're kind of famous for letting them themselves run one too early in races where they control the race. But interestingly, uh, Irad pushed Jose aboard uh, search uh, search results and that uh, they ran fast, 109, and uh, they were not around. Search results uh, took over the lead, but clearly the two regally bred Curlin, daughters of Curlin, were, uh, were just uh, eating them up quickly uh, late on the turn and early on the stretch. And here you have it, Matt. Um, you know, Clarier, this was her third race of the year. Malathoth, this was only her second race of the year. I don't know if that has any bearing on the result, but uh, now five races into their rivalry and finally Clarier getting the better of her rival and her uh, uh, fellow daughter of Curlin. Uh, we have a real rivalry between two really nice four-year-olds. Uh, it'll be interesting to see Clarier and Malathoth because I think, I think once again, we'll see them race against each other a bunch the rest of this year. Yeah, and you could see from that photo, the the, the margin, you could see less than a head, a nose, uh, a difference between them. And I think the Pletcher camp was saying after the race that uh, they're going to try blinkers on Malathot a little bit because she kind of was, you know, hanging a little bit uh, in the stretch. And, and let's face it, she's been a horse that has kind of just done enough down the stretch to get victories, but, you know, ran into a tough one in Clarier. Yeah, and and, and let's, yeah, I, I still love Malathot, and she's never run a bad race, but let's give Clarier credit, because I'm sure yeah. Malathot knew she was there the whole stretch. They were, they were going at it tooth and nail pretty much the whole stretch as they rallied together and took over, and Clarier was the better horse the last 100 yards for sure despite a pretty uh, um, uh, relatively short margin there of victory. Matt, let's finally get to the race of the week this week. We got the Salvatore Mile. I don't know how much of a race it is, but I think this is a question mark for Hot Rod Charlie. Hot Rod Charlie coming back. Uh, he's only been away, I guess, about three months, but he's he was in Dubai for two races. He was overseas for, for a while early this year. He was running a mile and a quarter. Now he has to come back at a mile at Monmouth Park in this grade three Salvatore mile. By the way, it's nice to see the Salvatore mile uh, have another big name in there after uh, after years of, of really not having quite the biggest name. So it's good to see Hot Rod Charlie going to Monmouth Park, coming back in the Salvatore mile, last out really good second in the Dubai World Cup. It, it looks like he stands over this field match shipment if he – is near his best yeah that's for sure and hey monmouth park trying something new with a uh haskell preview day card um with a bunch of stakes that uh are designed to be prep races for the stakes that show up on haskell day and and you know without running the races it looks like they've done well they've got good sized fields and some interesting horses some big names like uh, Hot Rod Charlie, I guess uh, Doug O'Neill uh, willing to make the trip out because Hot Rod Charlie uh, has run well at Monmouth Park uh, at cross. You remember Brian crossed the finish line in front in the uh, Haskell, but then got disqualified. But uh, that was no fault of the horse. Uh, now Mike Smith 
is getting on board and coming west with the horse. Um, hey, Bri, I don't think Hot Rod Charlie's going to have any trouble off the layoff. Um, going a mile, it seems like a really good spot for him to come back in. Obviously, uh, he can travel well. He did he did really well over in the Middle East with a win and then uh, a second in the Dubai World Cup. He's already run, won more than five million dollars yeah five million dollars that's uh, that's nice to see he's he's you know there's there's no secret that he's been one of my favorite horses since the breeders cup juvenile and uh yeah i, I agree with you i think he his works look like he's ready i think this could be a tricky spot with the one mile distance and the, and the time off and all the travel but yeah, Hot Rod Charlie really hasn't run a bad race. I know he was fourth in the Breeders' Cup Classic, but even there, I think he ran a good race last fall. Uh, he hasn't run a bad race since since breaking his maiden and then nearly winning the Breeders' Cup Juvenile is a big long shot. Uh, finished first in the Louisiana Derby and the, and the Pennsylvania Derby. I was hoping you wouldn't mention the Haskell, but it, it was at Monmouth Park, so you had to do it to me. Yeah, yeah. He, he got taken down that day. That was a little disappointing. But Hot Rod Charlie has been just a very – very excellent horse now for a, a year and a half or more and uh i'm looking forward to seeing him come back now this field here let's take a look at the field again i think there's a few horses we can talk about certainly mind control has run some very big races uh last year he did it in, in the nehru and, and that mile at parks um he has had two races this year and he had the unfortunate uh, uh job in coming back to the races of first chasing uh i guess it was speaker's corner first and then chasing jackie's warrior last time that's tough to do if you look at mind controls form you say well he's not been great this year but he's chasing speaker's corner and jockey's warrior yeah that's for sure brian you know he's six years old now and and, and won more than a million dollars um uh, a, a veteran for sure, and, and as we know, was stabled at Monmouth Park for a good amount of the early part of his career. Uh, um, the win last year in the Parks Dirt Mile, two turns, two turns here at Monmouth, uh, uh, makes me want to consider mind control a little bit more. You know, I think he's probably best around one turn, but he did win that uh, two-turn race. And yeah, he he had a couple of tough spots. And a third in the Carter this year is, uh, is a nice result. Yeah, he's a game horse, Matt. He's on the rail. He's got probably the most speed in the race. Finally, he doesn't have to chase crazy good speed here in his third race of the year. So I think he's dangerous because he's a miler speed on the rail and he's also a very game horse so hot rod charlie's not been known to blow by horses mind control could be tough in here the number four is cheryl spade and he's a really really talented horse we knew this early on in his career he's a graded stakes winner on synthetic surfaces he's a grade one winner at a mile on the turf which happened just a couple races ago a really talented horse who hasn't looked good on the dirt yet but the son of spacetown you know, I think Roger Outfield knows what he's doing in trying him on dirt again. I think there's a dirt horse in there, but still it's tough to switch to maybe your third best surface against the likes of Hot Rod Charlie. Yeah, that's for sure. But as you said, Brian, Hall of Fame trainer Roger Atfield uh, making a move like this, shipping down from Canada, from Woodbine. Um, Woodbine uh, uh, rider Emma Jane Wilson is coming down for the race also. Hey, you, you got to respect uh, Cheryl Spite just off of that. Yeah, and the fact that he's a grade one winner two races ago, uh, out a mile. That was turf. This is dirt, so we'll see. But uh, Cheryl Spite, mind control, interesting horses, as is Helium, Matt. Helium has not won since that Tampa Bay Derby last year. I thought he ran a decent race in the Kentucky Derby, and he's run some decent races since. He just hasn't found the winner's circle. Two races this year, I guess he was second both in allowance races, good allowance races, stakes horses in those allowance races at Woodbine. So he might be fully cranked now and ready to show his best. I don't know if he's good enough, but looking back at the Tampa Bay Derby and Kentucky Derby, he's, he's a pretty talented horse as well. Yeah, that's for sure. Mark Cassie runner, and Mark Cassie likes to uh, 
run his horses into shape on the racetrack and hey got a shot in my eyes Yep, my eyes too. He he's one. Uh, I, I guess mind control. I think of as the biggest threat to Hot Rod Charlie in here, but certainly uh, helium is his threat. We probably should mention the Fat Man. There's no the in yeah. his name. I just like saying the Fat Man, because the Fat Man has won at a mile. He's a stakes winner at a mile. He's a stakes winner at Monmouth. Uh, second race off a layoff. His first race off the layoff wasn't good, but he certainly don't. Uh, the eight-year-old gelding could wake up here and he's run well at this track at this distance before yes absolutely he's run well at this track last year uh he was third in the grade three islin um and last year he won a stakes race at delaware park uh he gets uh leading rider paco lopez in the saddle so if he can take a step forward from that uh, uh first race back that you mentioned brian he could be a contender, uh, eight years old. He's got nine wins and nine seconds in his career. Yeah, a nice horse, and uh, we look for better than he showed last time. So, uh, Batman, uh, a possible long shot here. I guess what I'm saying, Matt, as much as I love Hot Rod Charlie, I'm not going to like the odds in any shape or form here in the Salvatore Mile. He's got some negatives coming from Dubai, coming off a layup, coming off 10 furlong races. So this is not... I don't think it's a walk in the park at very low odds. Yeah, and and it certainly at those odds makes it a, a harder betting race. But uh, if 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 I was going to be betting, maybe I would take a shot with a fat man uh, getting into the exacta at a good uh, at a good price. There you go. I I worry about mind control speed and mind control's ability to fight all the way to the wire. We'll see. That's the Salvatore Mile, the highlight. As Matt mentioned, a very good card at Monmouth Park, both on turf and dirt. We should also mention the, the uh, Pegasus, Matt, because the Pegasus has had some real impact on the Haskell in recent years. And as you said, the Haskell uh, a preview day, if you will, here at Monmouth Park. Uh, there's some interesting horses in this Pegasus. I don't see a Haskell winner per se in this field but uh in homebrew a pretty lightly raced horse for bride cox electability a pretty lightly raced for race horse for trainer chad brown and, and maybe dash attack we have some uh, graded stakes potential here in the pegasus yeah and and uh, in the last few years the pegasus uh, uh has had some nice winners last year it was mandaloon um, and a couple years before that, of course, maximum security was upset uh, in the Pegasus before he went on to win the Haskell. But uh, yeah, the, the, this Pegasus field has got some names that we that we should recognize. Some names of some horses who uh, uh, were briefly on the Kentucky Derby Trail. Um, you mentioned Home Brew already. Brad Cox, Florent Giroux coming in to. Uh, keep them out on the horse. He was last seen in April winning the Oaklawn Stakes and, and has been training very steadily uh, at Churchill Downs since then. And uh, since Brad Cox's return, uh, his horses have been running well, and it's hard to ignore any Brad Cox runner, uh, even if it is off a bit of a layoff. Yeah, Brad Cox brings a lot of these three-year-olds back in the summer. We've seen it uh, over the last several years where they just start to clean up in the summertime. And Homebrew ran a bad race, two races back, but uh, he's got a lot of wins besides that. Looked good winning that Oaklawn Stakes uh, early April, so it's been just about two and a half months since we've seen him. But this is this is uh, typical Brad Cox and Homebrew. Florent Giroux up could very well be the horse to beat in here. Electability chased we the people last time it looks like electability has some talent he probably would have done better on a fast track at least uh making it more of a race with we the people but he held on for third that day he's certainly a threat dash attack has won a couple stakes this year matt but they both came on off tracks and it looks like you're going to have a fast track there in new jersey on saturday um i hope so it's raining it's raining pretty hard in, in, in new jersey right now but we got a couple days uh before that Dash attack, uh, um, Kenny McPeak, and one of those victories was at Monmouth Park recently in the Long Branch Stakes over a good horse in Dean's List. Right, right. If 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 Dash attack can bring that off track game to a fast track, I think he becomes a threat, especially with 
the other speed in here. All right, that was a quick look at the Pegasus, the Salvatore Mile. Of course, we look back at all the biggest of winners. We didn't even talk about, geez, Matt, we didn't talk about Jockey's Warrior or Casa Creed or, or Bleecker Street, who's still undefeated, or Regal Glory. Uh, what a weekend of superstars at Belmont Park. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Folks, if you haven't yet subscribed to our YouTube channel here at, at Horse Racing Nation, do that now for Matt and I. We appreciate it. You can turn on those notifications so you don't miss any horse centers. Matt, can I get a parting shot from you, my friend? Absolutely, Brian. So I guess we're kind of at the midpoint of uh, of the 2022 racing season. Triple Crown is done. Moving ahead with uh, uh, the rest of the three-year-old races and trainers starting to think about the Breeders' Cup. So stay with it, stay with us at Horse Center. And as always, thanks for watching the show. And and I'll just add on to your excellent parting shot, Matt. Saratoga is not that far away. We we have Saratoga to look forward to as well. I want to thank our sponsor, Derby Wars, the best contest site out there. Thanks to Candace Curtis for the race graphic. And thanks to Naira for all those photos from Belmont Stakes Weekend. Folks, we hope you enjoyed another episode of Horse Center here. We will see you next week as always. Thank you. See you then.